Well, welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's uh, special Wood Solutions and Timber Frame Collective webinar on residential timber construction. In the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and we acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship with country and forests. We pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. My name's Alistair Woodad, I'm one of the Wood Solutions team. Um, you probably all know about Wood Solutions. It's uh, an initiative funded by our Australian Forest and Wood Products of Australia organisation. It's um, it's there really for you as building professionals. For uh, um, We really want to inspire you about using timber. And if you want to use timber, then to provide you with whatever, whatever information and resources you might need. So we undertake a range of different activities, such as uh, events today, um, these webinars. Also, these days, we're back to face-to-face -face seminars, which is great. Um, but we produce a lot of technical information. That's probably one of the key things we do. And we have quite a wide, wide range of technical design guides, 53 of those at the moment, which are all freely available and downloadable from our woodsolutions.com.au website. And I really encourage you to have a look at that. Um, we undertake quite a few events, and you can find these on our website. Just go and tick on the events uh, tab at the top. Uh, we actually run a, a monthly webinar still since COVID, um, so the first um, Tuesday of each month. And then this is actually a special webinar. We're running a series uh, um, for the Timber Frame Collective now and in July. And I'll talk about the July one a bit later. Also, just so you know, all the webinars are recorded. So if you want to go back and have a look at this afterwards or you enjoyed it and want to let one of your colleagues know, simply either put webinars in the search box or click under resources, the webinars section. And uh, when you click onto that, you'll find access to all the webinars we've done uh, actually since COVID started. There's, there's probably almost 90 of those uh, webinars available now and some really great topics there. In terms of interacting in today's webinar, um, if you want to chat with one another, please use the chat function. Just click the all panellists and attendees. But more importantly, we are keen to get your questions. We will have some Q&A at the end. So please add that under the Q&A tab. If people like a question, hit the thumbs up um, sign and that will simply prioritise that to the top and we'll get through as many of those as we can at the end. You will can also get CPD points for today's um, webinar. Um, I'll give a couple of questions, uh, CPD questions shortly, and you just need to keep them for self-assessment. You don't have to send that to us. You'll also receive a certificate of completion within a week of attending the webinar. Just check your junk, junk mail if you don't see that in your normal mail. Sometimes it ends up there. And please store those certificates in a safe place because we really can't uh, reissue those. As I mentioned, this is a special um, webinar today we're doing in conjunction with the Timber Frame Collective which is um, a group of supply chain companies that are there, uh, effectively the collective voice for the Australian timber framing industry. And, and we really want to sort of help anyone that uses uh, timber and, and timber is the predominant material. Um, look, I've got just a short little video here that uh, um, sort of puts a message across at the moment, particularly around timber framing from a carbon point of view and why it's such an in important environmentally friendly material. So please enjoy this, it only goes for a minute or so. Mm -hmm. Timber is just as nature intended, organic, non-toxic and biodegradable. It doesn't pollute our skies or litter our oceans. In a world that desperately needs to cut emissions to avoid irreversible climate change, sustainable timber framing is part of the solution. Between 30 and 50% of a building's total carbon footprint is created in its construction. But when you choose to build with timber framing, which has the lowest carbon footprint of any mainstream building material, things look much brighter. The production process of timber, from planting and harvesting to manufacture, transportation and installation, is carbon positive. So unlike the manufacture of highly energy intensive building materials, the timber industry actually removes more carbon dioxide than it emits. Let's build a better world. Let's build with timber framing. It's a great video. I couldn't <clears throat> say any of any of that better. Some really important points there about from an environmental perspective why timber is such a great product. But obviously, as uh, building professionals, you all know it's other values. It's low cost, long lasting. You're all very used to it. it it's very plentiful. There's some really good information um, the Timber Framing Collective puts out. If you want to use that with your customers, just go to their website. <clears throat> there's a click on website to uh, the renewable timberframing.com.au section where there's a range of information that you might, might, if you want, be able to use with your customers. And in our July presentation, I'll chat about this at the end, we'll talk more about um, uh, the, the, the Timber Frame Collective and what the uh, program offers. 
So we're just getting on to today's pre presentations. We've got two great presentations for you around seven star solutions and managing the weather. And uh, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Firstly, Dr. Philip Christopher, who is a research fellow in infrastructure engineering at the University of Melbourne. Philip specializes in sustainable material for construction, prefabricated systems, and the thermal performance of building fabric, particularly in the residential housing sector. Philip has over the past 18 months undertaken a number of specific research activities for wood solutions, examining the impact of the new seven star energy efficiency provisions on residential homes throughout Australia. Our second speaker today is Nick Q, who's the design services manager for Australia and New Zealand at Pryder Australia. He's been with Pryder Engineering Design Services for over 13 years and specializes in engineered timber truss and frame systems and on and off site prefabricated construction. Prior to working at Prada, <coughs> Nick spent 10 years working as a frame and truss detailer, specialising in roof walls and floor truss detailing for residential and commercial structures. And Nick regularly assists builders with on-site truss installation questions. So we've got two really competent speakers for today's topics. What we're hoping you get out of today in terms of the learning outcomes is an understanding of the regulatory drivers and take up of seven star energy efficiency provisions in Australia, an understanding of the comparative impacts of different external building envelope components and contributing to achieving a seven star home performance and an understanding of the important factors to best protect your timber frames during construction. So the three simple CPD questions, and I'll put these in the chat shortly. Uh, when are the new seven star provisions due to be introduced in most states? This is the top two ways of improving wall thermal performance and list three important measures to protect your timber frames during the construction period. As I say, I'll put that in the chat shortly for you. So without further ado, I might stop sharing my screen and hand over to Philip. Great, thank you, Alistair, and uh, great to be back with the Wood Solutions webinar. So welcome, everyone. Uh, as Alistair mentioned, we'll be talking through seven stars in timber frame construction and uh, what, it will, what it will mean for the residential construction sector. So uh, let's jump right in. So today I'll give a bit of an overview. Uh, many of you will be across what uh, the, uh, the latest National Construction Code is all about, especially from energy efficiency. Some might be just getting into it. So I'll give an overview so that everyone's on, I guess, the same page. We'll talk a little bit about NATHERS as well, which is our uh, energy rating scheme and talking about what it includes, what the assessment um, is assessing for these residential homes, how we can um, achieve better performance before looking at some basics of energy efficiency design for residential homes. So we'll look at some things like orientation on, on the block, uh, what are we trying to achieve with energy efficiency, uh, and then getting into the nitty gritty, which I know a lot of you uh, are builders um, or engineers or architects and really want to understand the materials and how they impact the different uh, energy performance of homes. So we'll dive into some of the analysis we've done and what the results we found from windows through to insulation, through to some floor construction methods and a range of other um, considerations that you should be aware of uh, before finally giving seven take home recommendations uh, for seven stars. So thank you, Alistair, for the kind introduction. I don't think I need to uh, go over this any further. All I will say is if you're further interested in some of this work and this research, um, I direct you to the Building 4.0 CRC's website. A lot of great projects in the latest and greatest in construction in Australia. So have a look at that um, website if you are interested. So maybe we'll take a step back, uh, housing in Australia. So we've got a great diverse group here with us today at, Wood, uh, at this Wood Solutions webinar from all around Australia. Uh, so where are we at with housing in Australia? It does depend, but the vast majority of new construction in Australia, with the exception of the Northern Territory, are around the six star mark. Um, and that six another star, we'll talk about what that means a little bit later, uh, with apartments slightly more at 6.4. The ACTs, our best performing um, region, and that's got an average of 6.9 stars um, and very close to seven stars. So we do, for the majority of Australia, have a way to go to meet our new seven star provisions uh, for pretty much all states uh, and territories with the exception of the ACT. We're seeing homes getting bigger. We're seeing homes typically constructed with a concrete floor particularly waffle pod floors in, in Victoria. Uh, brick veneer walls also very common uh, and metal or tile roofs also really commonplace around Australia. If you're interested to dive into your state and seeing what construction materials are predominantly used, 
uh, CSIRO have a housing portal and you can have a bit of a play around and see what the latest uh, construction trends are for your state or region. Some great data there. So why most of us are here, uh, the latest NCCs coming in very soon. Uh, what's it all about? I will focus on some particular measures on the NCC, uh, the key changes under the energy efficiency provisions. The first of which, and the most major in terms of the change, is a minimum of seven stars under this NAVDAS scheme. So the previous one was six stars, as we all know, increasing to seven. What does that mean? We'll talk about it soon. Uh, but there is a range of other provisions that you should be loosely aware of, I guess, um, although they should be generally easier to meet or less strenuous than the seven star provision. Um, the first one is a whole of home and annual energy use requirement. So this will factor in appliances, the efficiency of those appliances, and allow offsetting of the energy use uh, with uh, solar panels or on-site electricity generation. Uh, this is separate from uh, the seven, minimum seven stars. So you cannot offset your minimum of seven stars with this whole home energy use. It's an additional assessment. There is also additional deemed to satisfy provisions for insulations and the like, uh, and they, they vary depending on our climate, our state, uh, walls, ceilings, roofs, uh, floors, et cetera. And we'll, we'll touch on them a little bit later on. There's also new provisions for retrofitting uh, renewables, electric vehicles, and enhanced condensation management. I'm not going to talk about any of those bottom ones. I'll just talk focus in on that minimum of seven stars, which is the real um, uh, challenge for a lot of the builders uh, in new homes. So people from all around Australia, uh, a few of you will be taking a big sigh of relief, maybe Tasmania, I see, and maybe the Northern Territory. I know we have a few people from Tassie joining in um, and uh, other states will be adopting these later. So uh, the, the three, oh, I guess, four main uh, areas that are adopting it as scheduled, 1st of October, ACT, um, Queensland, Victoria, and New South Wales. New South Wales has basics, as people in New South Wales will be well across, but the compliance tick for the energy efficiency provisions or one method of that is going to be seven star nathers. So essentially, New South Wales will have to comply with the, the same um, energy efficiency or housing energy efficiency provisions as uh, Victoria, Queensland and the like. Other states have either delayed um, the use or uh, I don't want to say watered it back, but reduced the, strength, the um, stringency. So, for example, in, in Northern Territory, limited to five stars from October 2023. Um, and uh, or pushed it back like South Australia. So you can look this up. There's a lot more little details for each state and they're beyond scope for today, but that's the general adoption of this new standard. So uh, taking a step back and having a look, what is Nathers? What does six star, what does seven star mean? What is it all about? Uh, it's the nationwide house energy rating scheme and it scores your home or the new home to be built based on its energy efficiency. Now, to be very explicit, this energy efficiency is for heating and cooling that home. It's not related to um, your pool pump or what sort of TV you've got or any other aspects of the home, except, and this is for just the uh, energy rating, not the whole of home I'm talking about here, but the energy rating. So just heating and cooling and keeping your home or the home comfortable for the occupants year round. Uh, it's adjusted based on the climate. So if a house in, uh, is to be built in, say, uh, Hobart versus Brisbane versus Melbourne, they'll have different uh, requirements to score six stars because they're in different climates. They'll need different amounts of energy to be efficient. So it's adjusted depending on the climate, uh, but the, the set points are the same. So people are still comfortable at the same temperatures. Uh, thermal bridging is not assessed particularly. Uh, in the latest revision of the code, it is at least putting steel and timber on par, so ensuring that steel framed homes perform the same as timber. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but explicitly thermal bridging isn't assessed. Uh, this is this assessment is typically done in software. There's three major software packages um, that accredited assessors issue certificates for for the new home. 
So with that in mind, uh, let's get into some of the details. So energy efficiency basics. These are obvious. I know everyone knows these or, or, or is across these generally, but I think it's worth restating them just so that the later slides make more sense. So when it's cold, either in winter in the southern states or maybe um, uh, most of the time in, in, some, in, in Hobart or, or further in, in Tasmania, we, we want to do different things to ensure that we stay warm um, or around our building envelope. So first of which, we, we want to minimise unwanted drafts. The word unwanted is really important here because ventilation, enabling people to open windows, is a really good thing. Uh, a lot of these things, and I've used green arrows to show, are also good things when it's hot. So we want to minimise draft. If it's really hot outside, we want to be able to close our windows and stay cool inside. If it suddenly cools off, we want to be able to open those windows and cool off the home uh, rapidly. So unwanted drafts, good sealing of our homes and good cross ventilation uh, are really positive things. Um, the drafts are not captured in the software. So it's assuming you're building your home relatively sealed. Uh, but cross ventilation is captured in these NADA's assessments. So having windows with more operability or opening more is a positive thing and cross ventilation is a positive thing as well, which will give you a higher star rating in the assessment. In the red box here, I've highlighted what the main things I'll talk about today are. Uh, no, the number one is minimize, minimizing heat loss or gain through the building envelope. So that's all about the materials, the insulation, the glazing. Uh, the second really important one is about solar heat gain. And if it's uh, cold and we want to stay warmer, then we want as much solar heat gain as possible. And if it's the opposite, we want to minimise that solar heat gain. We'll talk about strategies for that soon also. Thermal mass is also a really uh, spoken about a lot, I guess. And it's really useful if, and this is a big if, we can externally insulate that thermal mass. So keep it inside the home, I guess, and insulate it from the outside and have it heat when we, when we want it to be hot. So for example, have it exposed to the sun if it's cold and not exposed to the sun if it's too hot. And if these things are done wrong, thermal mass is actually a negative, not a positive. So, um, and many of you that may be um, double brick homes in a cold climate, uh, you get home from work and you haven't had the heater on, know all about how thermal mass is not necessarily a positive thing. So things to keep in mind um, as we go through. Site considerations are designing to make use of uh, solar heat gain, building on the south of blocks, locating our lounges and kitchens on the north of the block will maximise, and this is mostly for temperate climates, so not so relevant uh, for those of you further north, um, but it'll maximise our solar heat gain in winter. Having eaves will help prevent that summer sun coming in in summer when we don't want the heat. Uh, putting glazing or windows where we want to capture that heat. So on the north facades, obviously the, the most logical choice. Uh, and minimising glazing all around the rest of the house. Now, it's something that a lot of clients don't necessarily want. They want big windows on the south side. Maybe there's a good view. But the more glazing we put on the rest of the facades on the home will detract from the energy performance in most all cases, especially on the south and the west side. The west side, because we're getting a lot of potentially unwanted solar heat gain. Uh, and the south side, because we're getting no solar heat gain for the vast majority of the year, except in summer in the very early morning and very late in the evening, which we don't want either. So minimising that glazing will definitely help. Putting uh, aspects of the home that are less uh, occupied, so laundries and bathrooms and utilities on the west is also a good design principle because we're not conditioning these areas as frequently. We also don't want to shade all this good solar heat gain with evergreen trees on the north of our home. So some common sense things. Now, you might be thinking, does the software consider this? And yes, it considers almost all of these aspects with the exception of trees, if they're not already there and not included in the software's assessment. But most certainly, um, the solar heat gains included in the calculations in the software and hence the benefits for your star rating of the home. So with the principles out of the way, uh, as Alistair mentioned, forest and wood products, we've done a range of studies uh, for them, looking at what do we need to do, especially with the focus on timber framed homes, thermal bridging, and how do we get to seven star. I'm going to pull little bits and pieces from this study because it was a really big study, uh, but you're welcome to go and look at that. There's it's quite a comprehensive assessment around the different main climate zones in Australia, 
uh, and it's on the uh, website for Forrester Wood Products or Wood Solutions. So to give you a brief overview, we took the HIA standard home uh, and we designed it to a six star minimum compliant. And then we looked at a range of features that we could upgrade or change in order to try and get to seven stars. Uh, and we'll present some of that today so that you get a feel for what might make a six star, which most of us are building now into a seven star home. And what sort of incremental benefits can we get from changing different building elements? So let's start off with one of the main ones, uh, windows and glazing. So this was the number one factor we found to impact the performance of homes um, in our assessment. So what better place to start than here? Windows and glazing. So there's two things, main things you'll hear about windows. One is the U value. Uh, think of U value as how well insulated that window is. Um, it's the inverse of the R value for a wall. So a higher U value is bad and a lower U value is good. So if we look at some examples here on this table on the right, you can see your standard aluminium frame, single glazed, um, low quality, cheap window that you would put in, uh, see in most houses for the last sort of 30 years in Australia, has a U value of around seven, which um, obviously not, not very good performance. If we go through to a high performance double glazed unit with um, an air gap here or a PVC frame, we're seeing that U value of around three. So um, twice, more than twice as good at insulating from the heat or the cool from outside. So obviously big improvements. There is another really important coefficient for glazing as most of you across, I'm sure, but solar heat gain. So how much radiation is the uh, glazing transmitting through to the home? This can be good or bad. Uh, if we're in a hot climate, we don't really want much solar heat gain, do we? So we can minimize that with eaves or shading of our windows, or we can minimize it with glazing that has a low solar heat gain coefficient and reflects most of that, that um, solar heat. So it can be good or bad depending on our location, this glazing. So finally, some, some results as a researcher, this is what we'd like to see. There's a lot going on in these graphs, but I think just focus on uh, the blue bars. The blue bars are showing what change we had in star rating from our six star home. Uh, our six star home had a baseline of some low E glazing, uh, nothing special, uh, but we changed that glazing for our HI home to see what, what benefits did we get from changing it or cost, for example, and going to a, a clear glazing. Um, but you can see to go to just a double glazed clear windows around this home, we only added 0.2 of a star. So not, not outstanding. It didn't make this, this home anywhere near seven star. And by improving the performance of this glazing further, so going uh, double glaze with argon fill or double glaze with argon fill and low E glass, we're now getting a benefit of 0.6 stars. As we then change the frame, because this was aluminium frame was our base case, to a timber frame or a UPVC frame. So anywhere I've got timber, you could sub out for UPVC. We're getting a much bigger boost now um, or a bigger boost to that glazing up to a, a benefit of 1.1 stars, which would actually make our home 7.1 stars just by changing the glazing in the frame. Um, a lot of the builders might be thinking, yeah, you can, it's easy to say, but changing it to timber framed argon double glazed windows is expensive. And yes, I, we know that. So we, we did a bit of a cost analysis. Now, the costs are hard to come by for all the glazing and the latest figures keep changing um, almost uh, weekly. So this is our latest cost estimation. Now there's a lot of information here. I'll try and summarize it as, as best I can. Uh, but what we're looking at on this slide is uh, cost versus performance. So you can see we've got a lot of the homes over seven star, in fact, a majority in this instance. This was done with our HIA home slightly improved in other features. So in this instance, we had a waffle pod floor and the like. But what I want to focus on here is cost benefit. So these uh, bar charts here are when we changed out all the windows. And this basically from left to right is high performance glazing. Uh, our orange line showing our cost. We can see some minimums on our PVC framing because the PVC framing was a little bit cheaper than the timber framing. Uh, but otherwise, generally our cost goes up with, with higher performance. 
On the right hand side here, we just swapped out our living spaces and we kept our bedroom spaces uh, low E single glazed units. This is for Melbourne. Uh, and to see what performance we got. What you can see is two things. One, uh, all the windows when substituted out in this for this particular home, uh, when we got high performance, we got really high star ratings, but we also got pretty significant costs for that glazing. On the other hand, if we subbed out only our living spaces, we could still achieve seven stars, but it's significantly lower costs uh, for these particular units because we're not spending as much money on all the other glazing elements in the home. So the takeaway message here, particularly for Melbourne, is it's not necessarily best to simply upgrade all the glazing to the higher performance. Focusing on those areas that are conditioned the most will give you the most, I guess, bang for buck or performance from the home uh, without having as much expense. So do your non-conditioned spaces last. They're your laundries or garages, uh, followed by your bedrooms, followed by living spaces um, in terms of low priority to high priority. We did the same analysis with Brisbane, and I know we've got a lot of uh, people from Queensland in. And what did we find for Brisbane? Well, we found actually that the bedroom spaces became more important in um, Brisbane than they were in Melbourne. That's typically, I, I think, due to the fact that we've got warmer nights in Brisbane and we've potentially got more air conditioning load in these spaces. So we've still got a pretty big saving, uh, but we've got, I guess, less of a performance discrepancy. Uh, or I guess more of a performance discrepancy in the in the ratings when we're doing our living spaces and versus all our windows. So for those of, in Brisbane, uh, the bedrooms became slightly higher priority for the glazing uh, units. The other takeaway message that I didn't mention from the previous slide was that timber uh, and PVC frames did perform better, but our PVC frames typically had a lower cost point um, on those particular units. So for insulation now, uh, having a look through at our insulation, uh, there's minimum requirements for the different uh, regions, but focusing on performance, uh, the cost really blows out once we start to bump up that performance of our insulation. So wall bats of R2 are almost half the cost when compared to R2.5. So the performance benefit from going up that, that little bit had a huge cost. We found the cost for ceiling insulation wasn't as pronounced uh, and we got better benefits in performance from upgrading our ceiling insulation. Focusing in on the wall though, and this is a really important point, as I said, our cost from R2 to R2.5 almost doubled, but for our typical home upgrading from R2 to R2.7 in this instance, only gives us very tiny performance boosts in our star rating. So filling out that, that extra insulation in the walls really didn't give us drastic benefits. And the main reason for this is without upgrading the glazing units in these walls, we really don't see as big a performance benefits um, from upgrading the insulation. So as would make common sense, a holistic approach is important. And this flat blue line here shows us that uh, adding more and more wall insulation doesn't really give us much more benefit for a single glazed uh, window on a wall, but upgrading our wall insulation for a double glazed window actually is starting to give us a big performance boost um, on our wall. So windows first and then the wall insulation uh, because without good windows, we're basically letting all the heat in or out through those holes in the wall. So the final one I wanted to touch on today is floor construction. Uh, floor can impact the performance through thermal mass, ground coupling and insulation. We found our colder climates really benefited from subfloors. So those in Tassie, a subfloor with good insulation was a great solution. Temperate climates, Melbourne, Perth and Sydney really benefited from waffle pod slabs. And our warm climates, waffle pod slabs or concrete slab on grounds were really good solution for those as well. Uh, as you can see for Melbourne, our waffle pod gave us an extra 0.6 of a star compared to a slab on ground or a subfloor. So a great upgrade to get a 0.6 of a star um, for a Melbourne based home. We did find a range of seven star solutions for Melbourne and those in Brisbane, I didn't have a table for you, but seven star in Brisbane we found was much easier to obtain than, than for Melbourne. 
Uh, and also much easier in Sydney than Melbourne for all those of you in New South Wales. So Melbourne was a bit trickier being a bit colder. But our solutions were a combination of double glazing, increased ceiling insulation, or a better floor system. So it all at once, not necessarily just one or the other, but they didn't have to be very high performance in each one. We just needed a combination of measures. So the final thing I wanted to touch on just to make everyone across it was thermal bridging. We did quite a bit of study on this, um, but the bottom line of what I wanted to talk about was steel versus timber. Uh, we found that going to a steel frame did derate the performance of the wall uh, a reasonable amount um, using uh, for either a lightweight direct fix or a brick veneer wall. And the main way to combat this was with thermal breaks, as I'm sure you're all across. We found that a thermal break of 0.32 was the minimum requirement to get steel to perform on par with our timber framed construction. Adding extra insulation between the bats was not a common sense approach because we needed so much insulation to get that, that home or that wall to perform on par. So best to include more thermal breaks, hence more cost for a steel frame to meet the same requirements as timber. So uh, finally, seven recommendations for, for seven stars. Number one, get your assessor involved early. The assessor will have a whole lot of suggestions that will might upgrade the home's rating uh, at no additional cost. So getting them involved early is important. Number two, glazing is really important and can add half up to one star just by changing out the glazing. So getting a cost-effective solution for glazing uh, will make sense uh, for the home. Three, designing for location. We've talked about this a lot. Blocking the sun when you don't want the heat, allowing it in when the heat's of benefit will give you a significant boost in your star rating. Insulation, we've talked about the ceiling's the most important, followed by the walls and the floors. But don't forget between the garage and the home, we found R2 also helped in these areas. Zoning can also help the performance of your home. So having a few more doors to separate out those living zones will benefit your software assessment and hence your star rating. Colors are important. Going lighter colors where it's hotter and darker colors where it's cooler will help your home to benefit from the solar heat gain on the facade or the roof. And finally, fans, lighting and cross ventilation. Simply adding a fan in the living space can often increase the star rating of a home. Uh, having sealed down lights also helps from heat loss through your ceiling uh, and cross ventilation will also give you a bit of a boost in the software. So all things to consider. So that's that's all from me. Uh, I'll, I'll be here at the end to field some questions. So thank you. Thanks, Philip. That was great. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, um, attendees, if you've got some questions, please put them in the Q&A. We can, we can do that at, at the end. Uh, it, it really is a critical topic, this seven star. I mean, we're about five months out for most states to the conversion, so uh, there's not a lot of time left. So uh, yeah, really appreciate that information. It's really going to be an important thing we need to get our head around nationally. Then, Nick, are you uh, on board there? Thanks, Nick. Uh, our next presentation from Nick is uh, one when we sort of surveyed people recently before the webinar, which was a huge interest about caring for um, timber frames and trusses during construction. Well, we've certainly seen in uh, some states like New South Wales, a lot of rain about, so a lot of issues with mould and things growing on trusses and people unsure what to do there. And also uh, down, well, right throughout Australia, but in Victoria, unfortunately, we've seen a few uh, um, larger builders um, go into receivership, which means uh, there may be some jobs sitting out in the weather for some period. So it's really important that um, builders and other building professionals understand just uh, what you need to do for care for your timber frames uh, during that construction period. So Nick, I'll hand over to you. Can't hear you, Nick, and uh, you, you must be muted. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Alistair. Yep. Uh, and what a fantastic presentation to follow. So firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Wood Solutions and the Timber Framing Collective for the opportunity to present today. Um, got a short time and this topic can be quite broad. So I'm aiming to cover some of the most common issues that uh, we might face with timber framing when subject to weather. So just a quick intro, an overview of the areas I'm covering. A uh, very short look at exposure for different building materials. Some common issues you might expect to see with timber framing and trusses. 
uh, a quick slide or two on getting the roof on and sealing the building envelope for the maximum protection for the building. Uh, we'll look at some rule of thumb guidelines for exposure periods. I know we get asked that quite a lot. Uh, a few slides on mold and different treatment options. Uh, some common sense tips on preventing uh, water ponding. Um, how we normally like to address um, frames and trusses when we go through that remediation process. So like I said, quite a lot to unpack. So I'll go straight into it. So this slide, I'm not gonna harp on too much, um, except for, say, for saying that all building materials would be subject to some form or some level of weather exposure, uh, be it timber, steel, uh, aluminum or concrete, et cetera. Usually the impacts are uh, on durability, uh, could be then relating to structural performance in, in some cases. Ultimately, we're looking at the longevity for the life of the building. So whether it be timber, steel or concrete, some of the common issues tend to roll, uh, revolve around moisture ingress, uh, decay will come up often, corrosion and cracking issues, uh, or, or in one form or another, they could be sort of dimensional variations in the material itself. The key thing to un understand is uh, what material you're working with and uh, ways to get the best lifespan out of that particular material. Now, one example, and uh, by no means am I bashing steel framing at, at all, being a timber man myself, um, but they do market their product very well, very well. Um, however, just be mindful that steel can be subject to its own issues uh, and, and very similar issues to timber as well. Um, and what they don't tell you in the marketing spin can be found in other documents like um, the Blue Scope Tech Bulletin number 34. So definitely, if you're not aware of it, definitely a good resource. Um, so basically the message would be to, you know, empower yourself with all the facts so you, do, so you can make an informed decision. Now let's start with the most obvious problem and that would be moisture related issues. Some of the more severe causes uh, could be from rain, storm, or in some cases even flooding if you're dealing with subfloors, um, which then uh, leads on to moisture ingress and then ponding issues. Other times, it could be within the building itself. Uh, I know we get this a lot. You can see on that photo there, that's actually a plumbing leak. Uh, other times, humidity and cond uh, condensation in the roof space uh, can lead to a phenomenon called mechanosorptive effects, uh, a big word. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting term if you haven't heard of it. Now, that particularly affects roof trusses. So uh, we see that very, very commonly with unsarked tile roofs. And I'll go into a bit more uh, as we get further into the presentation. Uh, next, we have creep effects. So timber is quite unique. Um, we have a, a, a phenomenon called creep. Uh, it's also highly related to moisture and the, the, the sort of term of the actual loading. So with more permanent loads, long-term loading, we can, um, the timber can result in much larger deformations, uh, as well as what you normally would expect um, with swelling and shrinkage of the material itself. By far, the most, uh, the biggest problem, uh, you know, for, for at least roof trusses and framing is repeated cycles of wetting and drying events. And this is so, this is definitely something to be mindful about. Uh, degradation is the next uh, potential issue we might come across. So timber uh, can be affected in even very simple terms, it could be uh, surface defects, anywhere from uh, discoloration and graying uh, of which uh, UV exposure certainly doesn't help. So sometimes we, we come into instances where uh, packs of frames or trusses get stored in the yard of a, of a fabricator for months and months, and the, the UV exposure starts to actually discolor the timber before even, even any moisture actually gets into it. Other times, uh, remedial works may need to be, uh, may need, may need to be used to address uh, issues like warping and bowing or twisting of timber members. So another key takeaway here is that um, just because uh, uh, timber is graying or discoloration, it doesn't necessarily mean that the product is automatically defective. So it can still perform its intended function if it's correctly monitored and addressed. Next, we have corrosion. So corrosion usually affects metal components and not necessarily the timber itself. Um, so uh, 
items such as the nail plates, uh, fasteners for, for nails and screws and bolts, um, particularly strapping uh, or hoop iron, they, they, can, they can be very subject to uh, corrosion in the long term. Uh, and other metal connectors like um, what you might commonly see, multi-grips and framing brackets and, and you know, similar types of uh, steel connectors. Um, other than that, uh, corrosion can also um, uh, affect other items like metal roof battens, uh, potentially ceiling battens and other ancillary products. Now, sometimes they can be hard to detect. You can see in that uh, photo on the right there, uh, especially when uh, when an item like a, a nail or screw is embedded into the timber member. So it's definitely worthwhile to have, um, you know, have close examination um, to make sure that you can, you know, pick out all the, uh, wherever corrosion uh, occurs. Now, I suppose the bane of our industry, nail plate back out, uh, or sometimes you might ref uh, hear it referred to as nail plate withdrawal. So this is usually one of the most obvious problems identified uh, during an investigation, whether it be from the nail plate company or the, or the fabricator or, or an independent source or an inspector. Um, I already mentioned briefly before about how repeated cycles of uh, wetting and drying is really the biggest contributor to this. Uh, that's usually during the construction period before any, any roofing or any plating is, is installed. Uh, but sometimes it, we even see this in closed roof spaces. So that, that, that big term I mentioned before, mechanosorptive effects, that, that sort of is a contribution of uh, condensation, could be humidity and could be moisture coming, cycling through the roof space. Um, and as I mentioned earlier as well, it, it sort of, it tends to show up more in unsarked tile roofs where, where you can get moisture ingress through the actual tiles itself. Um, so that, that phenomenon is definitely something that can occur. It, it usually uh, occurs sort of the 20, 30 year term. So it's definitely not a, an early symptom. Uh, um, sometimes it can, it can be you know, much, much, much further down the process of the building life. Now, some of the challenges um, uh, with actual nail plate uh, back out or nail plate withdrawal relates to load carrying capacity, which, which could be obvious at first. So you might be, you know, you might be surprised that uh, uh, even up, upwards of one millimeter of uh, back out can reduce the actual capacity by upwards of 30% or more. Um, so we, we, we often, you know, when we go out to site, we, we you know, have built, uh, you know, contractors saying, oh, that doesn't look too bad. And, and you see the nail plate sort of almost pulling out of the, of the timber members. Um, so it can definitely have a significant impact if not corrected. Um, so it's definitely an issue we take very seriously. And, uh, and you'll see down the bottom, uh, I have the, that sort of disclaimer. So no, just hammering the nail plates back into place doesn't always solve the problem. Now, as far as uh, protecting the building, I, I suppose um, we looked at some of the common issues. Uh, we look at, you know, let's have a look at some of the preventative measures. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree that covering the roof is our first priority. And, and obviously that should be done as quickly as possible. Providing the correct and permeable membrane under the wall bottom plates can also help to prevent moisture damage. And similarly, getting the, uh, the walls and the building envelope sealed with sarking or suitable membrane uh, adds that second level of protection to walls and floors. But obviously there's gonna be occasions where some of these measures can't, can't be done or they're just physically not possible. So the last resort uh, maybe to look at um, tarps or other temporary measures or temporary linings. Uh, definitely not an ideal solution, but in the long term, if you look at the costs of um, implementing some of these temporary tarps, could definitely save you uh, in terms of the amount of remedial works and remedial costs uh, further down the line. In some cases, um, may, it may save, you, uh, save the actual building from being condemned. So let's, uh, let's talk about exposure periods. Now, uh, we get, uh, as I said earlier, we get asked this quite often. Um, and, and you can see that you know, it it's really becomes a rule of thumb. There is no, there is no one, um, uh, com, you know, one suggestion that will, that will you know, suit all conditions. You know, climatic zones will vary. Um, uh, so, so the, the actual, um, Variations can, can, can be by state, it could, could be by season, could be by rainfall. Um, 
so it depends on multiple factors. Uh, essentially, it's it's pretty common that uh, once you get to about two to three months in the construction process, you generally shouldn't find any issues. I mean that that's you know typically of what a normal building process would be. Uh, when you get upwards of about six to seven months of exposure, uh, that's where you might start seeing uh, issues such as uh, discoloration. You might see some minor nail plate withdrawal. Uh, you might see dimensional variations, sort of studs bowing, trusses bowing, and so forth. Uh, and in those cases, that's really where you know an inspection is recommended. Once you get beyond that sort of seven month period, that's sort of where we we see where the red flag you know comes up. It, it, and the hot and it's really uh, that stage where we do recommend we highly recommend that an inspection be undertaken. So the best option really is to implement protective measures as quickly as possible, as I said before, minimize further issues and degradation, which will add, uh, which can add up to um, you know a lot of cost down the line. Now, similar to, uh, uh, to to the Blue Scope document, we have an industry body called FTMA, which is uh, Frame and Trust Manufacturers Association. So they work closely with their members who are, who are nail plate companies and other other sponsors. Uh, as well as the three main nail plate companies prior to my tech and multi nail. So uh, we collaborate on everything related to the truss and frame industry. And we've, we've sort of come together and put together a best practice guide for timber framing. Uh, so some of the, some of the um, recommendations uh, will, will, will be in that document and it goes into a bit more detail if, uh, if you're interested. So contact either the FTMA, your truss and frame supplier, or one of the nail plate companies if you want to grab that document. Okay, moving on to uh, mold. So this is this is actually an interesting topic. Um, it's one where I could actually had the whole complete webinar talking about it. Um, it's quite fascinating actually, but I won't nerd out on all the scientific names. Uh, some of them I can't even pronounce to tell you the truth. Uh, and I'll focus on some of the key points. So needless to say, that mold can be a, a real health issue, especially black mold. So not all mold is going to be the same, um, and, and this uh, and the mold can arise from you know certain different conditions, humidity, moisture, and so forth. So it's always best to address the situation with that health and safety um, you know, factor in mind. Uh, so mold can start to grow uh, with moisture content even as less as sixteen um, percent. But more commonly, uh, you might start you might start seeing growth at about nineteen percent or, or greater. Uh, typically, you might see it on wall studs, um, cavities against the walls. Particularly, bottom plates are, are susceptible, um, and and you know commonly found on bottom plates of wall frames. Uh, other locations could be the underside of flooring uh, and floor trusses, um, as you can see in the the photo on the right. That's uh, white mold growth. Um, and it can occur on roof trusses too, but definitely not, not as uh, common on roof trusses. So with, with the actual uh, remediation process, the, it sort of depends on the scale of the actual growth. So for minor growth, it can be as simple as um, brushing and cleaning the surface uh, or the affected areas or members. Um, other detergents like um, bleach and vinegar may be required sort of so that for a, a medium growth situation. When you get to a more heavier growth, you may need something like a, a oxalic acid based solution. There are many out there in the market that you can purchase off the shelf. Um, through that remediation process, um, it's quite important to monitor and keep the moisture levels lower than 15%. Um, because mold has a phenomenon where it can cycle through dormant stages. Uh, it might look like everything's been clean and it's gone, um, but at some point in time, if the if the conditions are right, if the moisture content, humidity is right, it can actually start to reappear again and flourish. So uh, going through that process, try and keep everything back down to less than 15%, and that'll mitigate the, the risk of um, further growth. Now, for extreme situations, uh, sometimes you're not going to get rid of it. So, professional services may be may be needed to engage, uh, and they can help you through that cleaning process as well as um, you know how to how to dry out the the building itself. Uh, so, ponding ponding is um, can sometimes be as simple as regular cleaning and monitoring. Um, 
and it's 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 interesting how often we we do go and inspect sites and and see some th simple things that could be done a general uh, sometimes not done so what i'm talking about could be as simple as um a small pilot hole or a small drainage hole through particle board flooring uh, to allow the uh, the rainwater to pond, uh, you know to not pond on the actual flooring itself and and drain further down to the next level. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to uh, drill a big hole through the slabs. So in those cases, for slabs, you usually find ponding might occur you know, towards the external perimeters, uh, particularly against corners of wall frames. And so once again, that sort of leads to degradation of the wall bottom plates as the, as usually the first sign. Um, but something as simple as uh, you know a small five mil hole through the actual width of the uh, of the wall frame can help to alleviate the ponding issue, and um, uh, and then all the deposits that get left left over can be you know cleaned much easier without having all the water uh, sitting there. So the last couple of slides, I'm I'm going to be talking about um, some of the remediation methods that we we look at for frames and trusses and how we really deal with that. So for wall frames, for the most part, they are generally quite resilient and uh, may involve simple replacement of studs or, or lintels or, or some, you know, noggins, for example. Um, other, other rectification methods may actually involve uh, removal of the bottom plate. And that's where it becomes a little bit tricky because you, you then have to look at how do you support the wall frame while you rip the bottom plate out and replace it. Um, so sometimes can be a difficult task. Uh, but again, the key thing is to allow the frame to dry out naturally, uh, or sometimes you may have to look at mechanical ventilation. So going through that process first, allowing everything to dry out before you, you go through that rectification or remediation process is definitely uh, uh, the first thing we recommend. Now, as far as roof and floor trusses, on the other hand, uh, they're a bit more challenging due to the nail plated joints, um, which are, as, a, a, you know, as I've mentioned previously, uh, some of the more, more common, commonly found issues. So in very minor scenarios, it could be as simple as driving the nail plate back home in, into the timber. But as I previously mentioned, this is not always going to be the, the, the situation. Uh, and it's only a very, very sort of rare uh, scenarios where we might be able to do this. Following on from that, the next option uh, is to firstly drive the nail plate back into the timber. Uh, and then we, we look at using some small gauge screws. Usually we try and get around the, perim uh, the perimeter of the nail plate and then work inwards. And what that'll do is that'll lock in the nail plate and, and hopefully prevent any future movement of the joint. Um, once you get into significant plate withdrawal, I'm talking you know upwards of two, three millimeters where, where the plate's almost just hanging on. Um, those types of extreme measures, we, we have to look at using something like a plywood gusset. So again, drive the nail plate back in, and then uh, the, the, the plywood gusset is, is glued and screwed to the truss, and that then holds the nail plate in place to do its job, uh, along with the actual uh, plywood gusset, which forms the, the final joint. Of course, the very last resort is actual replacement. And unfortunately, this does happen. Um, there are there are instances where you just look at a job and and the, the actual cost uh, involved and the, the labor not just the you know physical cost of the you know the materials but the actual labor involved to do a lot of this um, just really outweighs um, yeah just it's just not economical so in extreme situations we may look at um, suggesting replacement of uh, trusses whether it's you know, a part of a truss or the, the full truss, sometimes uh, even even the whole roof. Um, but they they are really just some rare situations. We, we obviously try not to get to that level uh, where, where we possibly can. So one thing I want to sort of uh, finish off on and the concluding message, I suppose, uh, is to involve your truss and frame supplier as early as possible. Um, and seek you know, their assistance with the remediation process. They might be able to help you at first, uh, or they'll involve their nail plate companies and, and the engineers. Now, some situations um, you might, you might you know, um, uh, get involved with a building where, where it's much further down the process and you're not sure who the actual nail plate company is, 
uh, sorry, the, the trust and frame manufacturer is. Uh, in those cases, you're best to sort of contact one of the nail plate companies, uh, Pride and MyTech or Multinail, and through those companies, you'll be able to uh, seek assistance or at least hopefully identify who the supplier is. With that in mind, that uh, concludes my presentation. So I'll hand it back to Alistair. Thanks for that, Nick. That was terrific. And there's been some uh, really sort of good uh, chat uh, going on at the same time, which uh, which is terrific with amongst the audience. And we do have some questions here. We've got a little bit of time left, so we'll, we'll run through those. Um, so, so Nick, just, just since you were speaking just then, we might grab a couple of questions with yourself. Um, sure. Did, um, it was a question from Charles. If a rain-soaked house is allowed to dry, so back, you know, below that, um, down below 20%, obviously, back down to sort of 12 to 15%, does the mould issue resolve itself or does it sometimes require some further treatment? Uh, if you're not, if you keep it, if you keep the moisture level below 15%, that starves the actual mould from growing again. So in, in those types of instances, um, it may not necessarily need to clean it up depending on the mould. Uh, so, yes, it can actually alleviate uh, further growth. Yeah, yeah, that's no, an important point. Getting that moisture content uh, down down below that sort of 20% is the key with mould. It's always the hard hard part, unfortunately. Yeah, but, but people sometimes get a bit concerned about mould, but there's mould in the air. We breathe it every day. It's uh, it's really on, on the timber when we get that moisture content where it starts to grow. True. Um, Phil, we've had a few uh, questions here to, on, on Seven Star, which was certainly understandable. You've probably been having a look at those. Um, well, one earlier about small lot construction, which is is really important. With so much small lot construction, it's more difficult to achieve seven stars with limit, limited exposure to the sun. Yeah, do you have some thoughts on that? That is a real difficulty today with the density of building we're doing. Spot on. Yes, it is more difficult, and you should go lightweight construction. So uh, less thermal mass. If you haven't got much access to the sun, your thermal mass will only be a negative for you. It will be more costly to make a seven star home without these this free solar heat gain. So yeah, 100% agree. That's It's going to be more difficult, yes. And a question here uh, about um, thickness of walls. Has there been any studies in increasing the size of the timber frame walls up from 100 to 120? And how will we, this uh, affect energy efficiency? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Uh, part of one of the CRC projects we're working on is it doing exactly this. Uh, and yes, it will increase your energy rating because it will enable you to put more insulation or unventilated air gaps, hence a greater R value for your wall and hence better performance. However, um, as I mentioned, without upgrading the glazing, in turn, it will it'll potentially cost um, more than it's going to give back in benefit. Now, I'm just going to leave off Alan's question. And we work a lot with the builder and I've got the same question from the builder we're working with, which is, these deemed to satisfy provisions, meaning that we're going to need a, a thicker wall just to get in the deemed to satisfy provisional insulation of R2.5 or beyond. Uh, and my advice there is probably not to go to deemed to satisfy approach, go another's approach and make up those gains elsewhere. The cost of making that wall frame double or, or, or larger generally is going to be quite significant. It's going to change a lot of other construction aspects. So maybe look at better ceiling insulation, a better floor insulation system, a bit better glazing, um, the orientation of the home, you know, try everything or other things that might be more cost effective first. Deemed to satisfy is always going to be a little bit conservative versus Denather's assessment. So go through the assessment path is my yeah. advice there. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. That's a really good point. FWPA did quite a bit of study on that and gave advice back to the uh, um, when this was being introduced about the concerns that the DTS was advising there with thicker walls. Um, so certainly, I think as you pointed out, Philip, you know, uh, in uh, it, it, really this next phase is all about windows. If we get the windows right, it takes a lot of pressure off the 90 mil walls. So certainly for the audience's understanding, as, as we as we move in you know, beyond class one into some of the class two multi-rise type buildings, um, so three, four, five, six storey, then those wider walls give us uh, certain structural benefits as well mm -hmm. in terms of uh, capacity. So industry certainly happy to do sort of bigger studs in, in those types of construction where you're getting that benefit, but you know, really sort of sticking with the conventional wall frames for residential at seven star, I think is going to be a real key. Um, Jerry's asked, um, Philip, he's a little bit sceptical about the quality control on site and was wondering, in your opinion, what were the key issues that could impact on achieving the design in terms of the star rating and the built form? Yeah, you're not the only one. Um, 
it is two things the actual star rating the actual performance are not the same so the star rating doesn't include uh drafts and leakage or air tightness at a building envelope and that i think is the number one issue with new construction that quality control that will actually impact the occupants is having leaky windows and not a really good seal but it won't change the star rating um but other things that obviously over compressing the insulation so squishing it down in the ceiling if you're putting r6 and squishing it under battens from your ceiling that will mean the insulation just doesn't do its job gaps in the insulation obvious one you know you, if you've got five percent gap in the insulation you might as well have used a much lesser insulating bat so gaps not over compressing and sealing the envelope are really critical in terms of quality control and overall performance fantastic look we're right on 5 30 and uh, um, it's been a great uh, set of presentations this afternoon so i really want to thank uh, both philip and nick on behalf of everyone here um, as a member, uh, the um, as I mentioned, the recordings uh, are going to be available on the on the website over the next week. They should be uploaded. So uh, if people want to go back and review this, or they want to sort of encourage their uh, colleagues to have a look at it, you can certainly access it from uh, from the Wood Solutions website. Um, I mentioned at the start, this is um, a series we're doing with the Timber Framing Collective. So we've got the second one of these webinars on the twelfth of July. Um, this will be about the benefits of timber framing from the builder's perspective. Um, some really interesting presentations on prefabrication and panelization, so speeding up that on-site supply, and and then also um, we'd encourage uh, you to have some of your communications people along because we'll certainly talk about marketing the benefits of timber framing in terms of building a better world. So thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, it's been a great webinar. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you at our next lot of seminars and webinars that we have. Thanks all. Thank thanks, Alistair. Thanks everyone. Bye.